welcome to BCRS Zoom. This is Margaret Flowers, Director of the Research Program. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Nancy Lynn from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. Lynn has um, generously taken time out of her very busy schedule to join us today to talk about a study that she presented at the recent ASCO annual meeting that was held virtually earlier this month. And Dr. Lynn, I wanna thank you so much. I know you're incredibly busy and thanks so much for joining us and speaking to us today. I'd like to begin by just asking you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the work that you do both clinically as well as in the research realm. Sure. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Um, and also, of course, for all the BCR support for the past many years. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist and I specialize in the care of women uh, with uh, women and, some, and men with breast cancer. Uh, and I serve as Associate Chief of the Division of Breast Oncology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, my clinical and research focus has been on metastatic breast cancer, and I lead both the Embrace Metastatic Breast Cancer Program at Dana-Farber, as well as the program for patients with breast cancer brain metastases. Uh, clinically, I see patients uh, with all stages of breast cancer, but my research is really focused on two main areas. Um, the first is the, devel the development of more effective treatment options for patients whose cancer has spread to the brain. And the second is really trying to understand therapeutic resistance. Wonderful. Thank you again. So the study that you presented at the ASCO meeting um, was called HER2 CLIMB. Yeah. Um, can, can we start by just having you sort of set up the study? What were the goals huh. and, and why was this treatment, um, what was unique about this treatment approach? Sure. Um, so uh, we know that in patients who have HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, although the initial therapies can be effective, eventually uh, treatments um, can uh, stop working. And so we're trying to understand what is the next best treatment. So for patients, traditionally, the first treatment they might receive would be Herceptin, Progetta, and chemotherapy. And then when the disease gets worse, the next treatment typically would be Capsilla or TDM1. And when we get to the third, fourth, fifth, et cetera treatments, it's been unclear which is the best treatment to sequence next. And pre previously, the national and international guidelines have really suggested a whole variety of options that could be considered as the next option. Um, so what the HER2-CLIMB study uh, tried to do was to look at patients who had had received Herceptin, chemotherapy, Progetta, and TDM1, whose disease had gotten worse through these drugs, and to understand whether a new drug called tacatinib, which is an oral pill that targets the HER2 protein and reduces the activity of that protein, uh, is to understand whether adding that pill to a traditional regimen of IV Herceptin and an oral chemo called Zolota would be benefic beneficial for patients. And importantly, the trial included both patients with and without brain metastases. So just to clarify for our audience who may not be familiar with the drug name, we're really talking about a regimen of uh, HER2-directed therapies plus chemotherapy. So there are multiple HER2 therapies within that, that sequence of, of treatments. And then the tucatinib is also a new HER2 therapy. That's exactly right. So it's using an old HER2 therapy, Herceptin, which has been around now for 20-some years, along with a new HER2 therapy in pill form called tucatinib together with an oral chemotherapy pill. And so what is, what's new, different about tucatinib um, that, um, you, know, the, you know, we're looking at another HER2 drug. What's, what does right. this bring to the arsenal? Sure. Well, tucatinib, and particularly one of its metabolites, seems to cross into the brain more effectively than some of the other existing HER2-targeted drugs. Um, and this is important because up to half of patients with metastatic HER2-positive breast cancer will eventually develop brain metastases, and we really wanted for a long time to have more effective and more treatment options for these patients. So starting in about 2013-2014, uh, with support from the BCRF, we launched a phase one study at Dana-Farber that combined tacatinib with IV Herceptin that only enrolled patients whose cancer had worsened in the brain, so a, a very unique kind of study in that way. Um, there was no chemotherapy in this study. This was testing purely HER2-directed treatment. And what we found is that there were patients who experienced tumor shrinkage in their brain um, with this regimen. And we also noticed that there were patients who had stabilization of the cancer both in the brain and in their bodies, sometimes uh, lasting over one or two years. 
So that was um, interesting, and we could tell for sure that uh, this was attributable to the to catnip because the patients on the study had all had worsening of cancer on Herceptin. And again, in this study, we didn't include it, did not include any chemotherapy. So we could be quite certain that it was a jacatinib that was leading to the, um, the brain activity. And this gave confidence to the manufacturer of jacatinib uh, to include patients with brain metastases in essentially all of their subsequent phase one um, and, and, and later phase trials, including the HER2-Klein study. So that's, that's really exciting to hear that your support from BCRF allowed you to do that early study, really focusing on this unique population of people who had progressed to the brain. So yeah. that's, that's fabulous to know that BCRF enabled you to do that. So the re when you um, presented this data at ASCO, you were focused specifically on this population of patients whose breast cancer had progressed to the brain. And I, I wanna ask you to talk a little bit more about this population. Um, how frequent is breast cancer brain metastasis? How much of a clinical challenge is this in terms of treating it? And um, you know what what did we what did we find in this larger study of HER2 climb? Sure. So first of all, just to re reassure patients who have early stage HER2 positive breast cancer, um, spread of cancer to the brain as the first location of spread is still very uncommon. And so uh, I don't want to overly um, alarm patients who have early stage breast cancer, most of whom will be cured of their breast cancer. But once cancer becomes metastatic, if it's HER2 positive, then over a, a woman's lifetime, about half of patients will develop cancer in the brain. And what is very unfortunate is that until HER2 climb, essentially every large clinical trial in breast cancer, and the majority of most small clinical trials in breast cancer, have excluded or not allowed on patients who have active or worsening brain metastases. And it's, you know, obviously it's hard to make progress um, if we don't include the kinds of patients we want to help in clinical trials. So the overall HER2 climb results, which included patients with or without brain metastases, showed significant improvements in the duration of tumor control and overall survival. But at the ASCO presentation, we focused on the nearly 300 patients, so a large number of patients with brain metastases who were allowed to enroll on her 2 climb. And what we found is that the regimen of tecatinib, Herceptin, and Zolota resulted in not only a more than doubling of the chance of tumor shrinkage in the brain, but it also significantly delayed the time to the next brain progression, and it improved overall survival. And to give you a sense of the impact of the treatment, if we look at the most difficult to treat subset of patients, the patients who have almost universally been excluded from all other registration trials in breast cancer, that is the patients who had new or worsening brain metastases when they entered the trial. And we look at their outcomes one year after starting on the trial treatment. 72% of patients in the tecatinib group were alive compared to only 41% of patients in the no tecatinib group. And those patients did receive treatment. They got Herceptin and chemotherapy. They did receive standard treatment, but you can see that there was a very substantial survival difference um, favoring tecatinib. That's so exciting. I know that from the work that I do um, with the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance, uh, the, um, there's a lot of discussion about the exclusion of patients, certain patients, including patients with active brain metastases, as well as others that have comorbidities and other things that, um, other conditions that may exclude them from trials. I, I wonder if you could comment on, in addition to this really exciting outcome for this group of patients and, and really for all the patients who had, pro who had progressed on earlier treatments, how does this trial um, affect moving forward for HER2 patients, but also in clinical trial enrollment? Yeah. So again, you know, HER2-CLIMB is the first large randomized trial to demonstrate really quite definitively that systemic treatment in the form of a HER2-targeting pill can improve outcomes, including overall survival, in patients with active brain metastases from breast cancer. So it really demonstrates that by including these patients in clinical trials, it is actually possible to make significant progress. And I think until this point, there has been a fair amount of nihilism that you know these treatments are not gonna be enough or they're not gonna work. And so we don't wanna include these patients in clinical trials. And, and, I, and I hope that this result 
um, will really open up the door to more, um, more active inclusion of patients with brain metastases in breast cancer clinical trials. I'll note that in April, the FDA granted approval to the HER2-CLIMB regimen uh, for the treatment of HER2-positive breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer. And notably, um, the indication uh, for tacatinib, it's the first ever FDA approval in breast cancer that specifically notes the activity of the drug in brain metastasis patients. So, you know, I think that, you know, my hope is that this is just the, the first step and that this is going to uh, incentivize um, other investigators and um, drug manufacturers to really uh, more actively include patients with brain metastases in their um, clinical trials. Well, it is an exciting first step. So what, what's next for you in terms of um, following from these results? I know there's a, there's a cycle where we go from the bench to the clinical right. trial back to the bench. And right. so how does this inform your next steps? And specifically, maybe how, how might you utilize your support from BCRF to maybe go to the next step? Sure. Um, so first, I just want to go back in time, and I just, I do, again, want to really stress how important BCRF support has been. And you know, we started launching these trials of HER2-targeted drugs, including um, the first one that we tried, which was Lepatinib, uh, years ago. Um, and when we did that, um, trying to treat patients with brain metastases with HER2-targeting medicines, it was really, really out of the box. Um, and for decades, really, the only options that were offered to patients were radiation and sometimes surgery to the brain. Um, and so over the years that the BCRF has supported our work, um, we have developed three regimens, Lepatinib Zolota, Neratinib Zolota, and now Tacatinib Trastuzumab Zolota. And all of these regimens are actually included in the influential um, NCCN or National Comprehensive Cancer Network tre uh, Cancer Treatment Guidelines for patients who have HER2-positive breast cancer brain metastases. And, and I can tell you that, you know, based on where the field was at the time we started these, um, what were really kind of out there studies, um, that we would not have been able to complete them, initiate them, um, and, and move them forward as quickly as we did without the support of the BCRF. Um, but you know, despite these successes, we know that most patients, even if they have initial responses to these medicines, will eventually experience re-worsening of their brain cancer or cancer elsewhere. And we really wanna understand why that happens. And so with BCRF support, we are um, uh, utilizing some of the specimens collected from patients in the trials to understand what happens when cancers become resistant to treatments. And then in collaboration with another BCRF-supported investigator, Dr. Uh, Jean Zhao, we are trying to develop new regimens in the lab that would overcome this resistance, and then we can bring those regimens to the clinic. So we actually have a number of ongoing uh, clinical trials that have directly stemmed out of the lab experiments, and we have a, a couple of additional trials that are planned over the next uh, year. And then the other um, sort of direction of research that we'll be going in uh, this year is really that, you know, ultimately what we'd like to do is not, not just to treat patients with brain metastases, to, but to prevent them from happening altogether. Um, and so we are going to be analyzing um, the genetic patterns of patients' original breast tumors uh, to try to see whether there are patterns of genes or gene changes that could predict a high risk of brain metastases. And by doing this, hopefully we can better understand not only how uh, or what genes are important to allow uh, cancer to spread to the brain, but also to identify those patients who are at highest risk of brain metastases and then potentially consider some prevention type studies for those patients. So that's down the line, but, but we hope that that's where the direction of where we're gonna go. Well, that's great. Still a lot of work to do, um, but it's wonderful to see this progress. And I, Dr. Lin, thank you so much for joining us, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. 